بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وأرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا التباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه آمين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last week we spoke about the embargo, the economic sanctions that Quraysh had placed upon Muslims and in particular Banu Hashim and Banu Al Muttalib and the different the, the difficult circumstances, the tough times that the Prophet and the Muslims had to go through during those years. We also spoke about how that siege was lifted and how that embargo came to an end. And so it came to an end in the 10th year of the prophethood. In the 10th year of the prophethood. Although its end came as a relief, it was followed by several difficult and painful events in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, all of which occurred consecutively one after the other. And so for this reason, this year, the 10th year of the prophethood, is known as Aam al Huzn, or the year of grief, or the year of sorrow. And so today we're going to look at these events that took place in the life of the Prophet. It was an important year. These events were extremely important, they were a turning point as we will see insha'Allah ta'ala. So we start with the first event, and that was the death of the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Talib. And so only after a few months, after the end of the embargo, the man who had supported Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was now on his deathbed leaving this world. Abu Talib was dying and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came by his side. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to him, my uncle, say la ilaha illallah. Say that there is none worthy of worship except Allah. Give me this word so that I could witness for you on the day of judgment. Give me something in my hand so that I could argue on your behalf before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. All I want from you is to say this word. And so who was sitting there on the other side of Abu Talib? Abu Jahl. And so throughout the seerah, you will find this man in front of you causing problems. This is not the first time we have mentioned Abu Jahl. Wherever you go in the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, you will find Abu Jahl, you know, being there confronting him. And so he was relentless in his efforts to fight Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he didn't give up until the last, 
until the last moment. So Abu Jahl, along with another man, Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah, were sitting on the other side. When the Prophet wasallam said that to his uncle, Abu Jahl interjected and said, O oh Abu Talib, are you going to die on a religion other than the religion of Abdul Muttalib, your father? Are you going to denounce the religion of your father? And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa repeated it. My uncle say, La ilaha illallah. Abu Jahl continued to interrupt. And that went on until Abu Talib said his last words. And so what were his last words? He said, I am dying upon the religion of my father, Abdul Muttalib. Now, in a narration in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ was saying to his uncle, Say la ilaha illallah. And his uncle responded by saying, If it were not for Quraysh, if it were not for Quraysh who would insult me and say that it was the pains of death that made me say it, I would have said it to please you. And so Abu Talib knew very well that to say La ilaha illallah would please Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And he knew how much it would hurt him to know that his uncle died following uh, another religion. And so Abu Talib was even sympathetic to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even on his deathbed. You know, uh, from the beginning Abu Talib was supportive of the, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and sympathetic to him and to his da'wah. Even till the last moment, he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that if it were not for my people, you know, they would have uh, criticized me, they would have insulted me. I would have said I would have said it to please you. And so it was a matter of honor. It was a matter of dignity for Abu Talib not to say it. And that was when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam inna ka la tahdi man ahbab you, O oh Muhammad, do not guide whom you love. But rather, it is Allah who guides whom He loves. Yes, you really want your uncle to be guided, to accept Islam. You love him dearly, and you want good for him. But Allah has willed for other than that to happen. And so guidance is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with that, Abu Talib, he breathed his last and he left this world. The second event to occur in this year, and this was soon after the death of Abu Talib, was the death of someone else. And that was who? The death of the Prophet's wife, Khadija, radiyallahu anha. And so now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is dealing with this tragic event in his life. The death of Abu Talib. A short while later, it's mentioned two months. There are other narrations mentioning less than that. Khadija radiyallahu anha, she passes away. And so the Prophet ﷺ is still dealing with the death of his uncle and here now his wife, his wife passes away, the person who was the dearest to him. So we can see now why this year, the 10th year of the prophethood is referred to as the year of grief. And so it was the most tragic time on the Prophet ﷺ because two of the most influential people in his life who helped him with his da'wah 
you know, Abu Talib who supported the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam physically protecting him against Quraysh and Khadija radiallahu anha who supported the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with psychological support in addition to her financial support. Remember she was a businesswoman. And so suddenly these two pillars that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was standing on in terms of him preaching the message of Islam, they collapsed. And we should note here that this year is not called the year of grief or the year of sorrow or the year of sadness simply because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lost two people who were dear to him. Like any one of us, if we were to lose someone dear to us, it hurts us personally. But with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was different. It wasn't that this year was a year of grief because he lost people who were dear to him personally, but more important than that, it was a setback to the da'wah. It was a setback to the da'wah. And so now without Abu Talib protecting the Prophet وسلم, without Khadija radiallahu anha consoling the Prophet وسلم, you know, advising him and being there for him in the face of the opposition that he would receive from his people, it was a setback to the mission that the Prophet ﷺ was on. Now, shortly after the death of Khadija radiallahu anha, the Prophet ﷺ married his second wife. And that was Sauda bint Zam'ah radiallahu anha. And so she was one of the early Muslims who had migrated to Abyssinia. And so she migrated there with her husband. And it so happened that either while they were there or as soon as they returned to Mecca, he had passed away. Her husband had passed away. And so the Prophet ﷺ married her after that. Now we'll talk more about the wives of the Prophet ﷺ and his marriages and why the Prophet ﷺ married multiple wives. We'll talk about that later on when we get to the Medina stage of the da'wah where the Prophet ﷺ married many, many more wives. And so we move on to the lessons that we learn from these two tragic events in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. The first lesson that we learn is in the case of Abu Talib. The reasons why people, they disbelieve, are many. The reasons for kufr are many. People disbelieve for different reasons. But one of the most common reasons is that people do not want to give up the ways and customs of their people. They were brought up a certain way, with certain habits, with certain customs of their people. And a religion that they had adhered to throughout their lives. And they don't want to give it up. And so nothing stopped Abu Talib from believing except this reason. He just could not let go of tribal pride and being criticized by his people for abandoning their religion. That's all he feared. And he told the Prophet ﷺ, he said, if it was not for my people, 
that they would criticize me, they would insult me. If I said, La ilaha illallah, I would have done it. And so Abu Talib is not alone. Many people, even today, the reason for their kufr is this stubbornness. Even after recognizing the truth of Islam, they do not accept. Why? Because they don't want to let go of their lifestyle, their way of life, the religion of their people, the ideologies of their people. They don't want to let it go. And they don't want to be criticized by their people for letting go of their way of life. The second lesson that we learn is the consequences of bad companions. Here we had two leading figures of Quraysh who came to see Abu Talib at his deathbed. And they wouldn't have come to him unless they were close to him. And so their influence on him in the last moments shows us how dangerous it is to befriend evil people. And so one of the greatest lessons that we learn from this is being careful of who we choose to be our friends. And so if this was the case with Abu Talib, that these were his companions, even though Abu Talib was known to be an intelligent person, and even though he supported the Prophet ﷺ the way he did, if that is Abu Talib, then how about the rest of us? If he could easily, you know, have been influenced by his people and you know his companions, then how about the rest of us? And so this is one of the greatest lessons that we learn from this incident. The third lesson that we learn is that no matter how loving and supporting and caring a kafir is, he or she is still a kafir in the end of the day. A kafir is a kafir. A mushrik is a mushrik. They are people who are despised by Allah. Allah is not pleased with them. And so we should not be pleased with them. Abu Talib, after he passed away, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I am going to continue to pray for Allah to forgive you. After he passed away, he said this. That I'm going to continue to seek forgiveness for you. And so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, forbidding him from doing so. I mean, think about it. It was a very difficult time for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Remember, Abu Talib was the one who raised Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa up from the age of eight after the death of his grandfather. He raised him up. He sponsored him. He took care of him. And then not only in his childhood but also after he became an adult and he became a prophet. He stood by him, supporting him, defending him, protecting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa for over 42 years. And so it started at the age of eight and it went on until the Prophet ﷺ was now 52 years old. So we can say that Abu Talib had given most of his life, spent most of his life in the defense of Muhammad ﷺ. And so it was a very difficult time for the Prophet ﷺ to see his uncle, his dear uncle, to die as a kafir. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, Okay, you've died as a kafir, but I'm going to ask Allah to forgive you. you know, perhaps 
Allah will forgive you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُوا لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ وَلَوْ كَانُوا أُولِي قُرْبَى مِنْ بَعْدِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُمْ أَصْحَابُ النَّهُ In Surah Tawbah. It is not for the Prophet and those who have believed to ask forgiveness for the mushrikun even if they happen to be relatives after it has become clear to them that they are the companions of the hellfire. Meaning, after it has become clear to you that they have died upon kufr and they are headed for the hellfire, you are not allowed to ask Allah to forgive them. The fourth lesson that we learn is that guidance is not in the hands of anyone except Allah. Even the Prophet wasallam, he didn't have the power to guide. His mission was to convey the message, not to convert forcefully. Converting the heart of a person this is only in the hands of Allah, not in the hands of people. Yes, we can guide in the sense of showing the way. And that's why the ulama, they mentioned that guidance is of two kinds. You have guidance of irshad and bayan, the guidance of showing, clarifying the truth, guiding people in that sense of conveying the message, making it making it clear to the people. And then you have the guidance of tawfiq, which is the guidance of the hearts. And so the first kind of guidance, yes, we can do that. And that is what we're required to do. And that is what the Prophet ﷺ did in his life. But as for the hearts, it's not in our hands. And so ultimately, it is the people who will have to make their own personal choices. You can do all you can, but in the end of the day, the person has to make his own choice. The person has to make his own choice. And this is basically the free will that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. And that is how we will be held accountable before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is because of this freedom, this free will that Allah has given to us, that we will either end up in Jannah or in the hellfire. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to remind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about this. that you really want him, Abu Talib, to accept Islam. And you have done everything you can, but in the end of the day, his guidance rests in the hands of Allah. And Allah decided, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, Allah decided that he will not be guided. And perhaps it was this reason that we mentioned earlier the reason for his kufr. And that is, you know, even after the truth became clear to him, and it is obvious, it was his stubbornness and not wanting to give up that tribal pride and the religion of his people and his forefathers. The fifth lesson that we learn, although we mentioned that a kafir is a kafir no matter how kind and how just they may be and that every kafir is headed for the hellfire if they die upon kufr although that is true Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just and his justice means that he will not treat everyone in the same way so even the kuffar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will not treat them all equally. Some will get a worse punishment than others.
And so some will get the punishment of Abu Lahab and Fir'aun and the Munafiqoon who Allah tells us will be in the lowest pits of the hellfire. But others will receive the least amount of suffering in the hellfire. And so in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ says, among the people of the hellfire, Abu Talib will suffer the least. Out of all of the people of the hellfire, Abu Talib will suffer the least. He will be he will be wearing shoes of fire that will boil his brain. And so, this is the least, the least amount of suffering of the people of the hellfire. So you could imagine what would be worse than that. But the point here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. And so because of how much Abu Talib supported the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala took that into consideration. And so he will not punish him like he will punish the others. Finally, the last lesson that we learn here, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who had freedom of going around preaching the message of Islam was now being blocked because his uncle passed away and so when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who would usually go home to find comfort with his wife he would go home and find no one when he had the protection of his uncle Abu Talib now he is open and exposed to danger. And so Quraysh can now easily harm him and plot to kill him. And so some of the scholars mention that there is a wisdom in this happening to the Prophet ﷺ at this particular time. The tragic deaths of these two individuals. And that is to increase the dependence of the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims to increase their dependence and their reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so rather than the message being protected by a kafir, Abu Talib, and supported by Khadija radiallahu anha, now there would be more reliance upon Allah because there was no one else. No one around Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave as much support to him as these two individuals. So now, now that they're gone, the Muslims will now have more tawakkul in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And that's why also some scholars mention, why was it that, what is the wisdom behind Allah not allowing Abu Talib to live on a few more years until the Hijrah. And so they mentioned that the wisdom behind that is so that people don't say that, look, he was able to escape, the Prophet ﷺ was able to escape, and the Muslims were able to escape all because of Abu Talib. And so the point here is, the lesson that we learn here is, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to teach the Muslims to put their trust in Allah alone. And this is something that we will see more in the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to al Madina. We move on now to the next event in this year, in the 10th year, which was also a very difficult moment in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that was his journey to a nearby city his journey to a ta'if now that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lost the protection of his uncle Abu Talib and his efforts of da'wah in Mecca were being blocked 
he tried to search for alternatives. Maybe there were others outside of Mecca who would accept his message, who would support him. It's as if he almost gave up on his own people. And so this was what led him to make his journey to Al-Ta'if. And so the Prophet ﷺ headed out on this journey with one of his companions. Who was that? Yes, Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu. And so they went to Al-Ta'if and Rasulullah went straight to the leaders of the town. And the main tribe in Al-Ta'if was a tribe of Al-Thaqif. So in Mecca you had Quraysh, and in Al-Ta'if you had the tribe of Al-Thaqif. And the main leaders were three, brother, three brothers who represented this tribe of Al-Thaqif. The Prophet ﷺ approached them, and he presented to them the message, and he asked them for their support and their help. What was the response that he got? It was a horrible response. And so the first of these brothers, he said, if Allah has really sent you as a prophet, then I'm going to go to Mecca and I'm going to tear apart the cloth of the Kaaba. And so the cloth of the Kaaba was sacred to the Arabs. And so he was basically saying, because there was this rivalry between Thaqif and Quraysh. And so he was saying that if you happen to be the prophet and you're from Quraysh, then I'm going to go and tear down the, Kaaba, the, the cloth of the Kaaba. The second among them, he said, did Allah not find anyone better? to send than you. I mean, out of all the people that Allah could have sent, He sent you. So again, insulting the Prophet wasallam and degrading him. The third one, he said, I can't speak to you. I simply cannot speak to you. Because if you are a messenger of Allah, as you claim, then you are such an important person and I am not qualified to speak to you. But if you are a liar, and Allah has not sent you as a messenger, and you are lying, then it's not appropriate for me to speak with a liar. So this was the response that the Prophet ﷺ got. After leaving Mecca full of hope, and so when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard their response, he said to them, look, fine, you don't want to accept Islam, at least keep this conversation of ours a secret. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not want news to reach Mecca. That he had left Mecca because he left Mecca without telling him. And so he didn't want news to reach Quraysh that he had been turned down by the people of Thaqif because it would only add to the persecution of Quraysh. But these men, they were so evil and they were so rude. They summoned the fools and the, and the slaves of the city and they told them, go and revile the Prophet ﷺ. Go and chase him down and curse him and insult him. So that's exactly what they did. And so imagine this mob pelting the Prophet ﷺ and Zayd ibn Haritha with stones and screaming and yelling at them and chasing them away. And so Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and Zayd ibn Haritha had to run out of Ta'if 
And so Zayd ibn Haritha, he was protecting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and shielding him with his own body, doing everything he could to somehow protect the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam from any injury. And so they ran out of Ta'if and they took shelter in a nearby garden or a nearby farm. And this farm happened to belong to two men of Quraysh, the two sons of Rabi'ah. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was exhausted and his feet were bleeding and he was hurt because of how he was treated by the people of Ta'if. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his help for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Zayd, they were very hungry. They were exhausted, they were tired, they were hungry. And so the two owners of the farm, who happened to be from Quraysh, they had some sympathy for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They saw what had happened. And so they sent their servant and said, go and give him some grapes. And so their servant happened to be a Christian. And his name was Adas. So he went with some grapes and gave it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received these grapes and before eating them, he said, Bismillah. Now, the servant, who was a Christian, he was surprised. And so, he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, these words are not said by people in this land. Meaning, the Arabs they don't say such words. We Christians, we do. We start in the name of God. And so the Prophet ﷺ realized that this man was not from here. That he was a foreigner. And that he follows a different religion. So he asked Adas, he asked him, where are you from? And what is your religion? So Adas, he said, I am a Christian and I am from Nineveh, which is a city in northern Iraq. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, so you are from the village of the pious servant of Allah. Yunus ibn Matta, the Prophet of Allah. And so Yunus alayhi salam came from that same from that same city. So Adas he said, shocked, he said, and you know Yunus ibn Matta? And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Yes. He is my brother. He was a prophet, and I too am a prophet. And so when Adas heard this from the Prophet wasallam, he immediately fell to the ground, and he started kissing the feet of the Prophet wasallam, and then he kissed his hands and his head. And he embraced Islam at the hands of the Prophet wasallam. Now, the two owners of the farm, they saw what was happening and they said to each other, look, he has already brainwashed our slave. And so the Prophet wasallam would never waste any opportunity to give da'wah. And so look at how the Prophet wasallam gave him da'wah on the spot. And these two men, who initially felt sympathy for the Prophet ﷺ, they were from Quraysh. And so they said, we are not in Mecca. We're, 
we're outside of Mecca in this foreign land. And we should support one another. We're from the same tribe. So initially, that's why they sent for food to the Prophet But now, they started to regret what they did. And so when Addas came back to them, they said to him, what's wrong with you? Why were you kissing his feet and his hands and his head? And so he said, Addas said to them, in the entire world, there is no man better than him. He told me something that only a prophet of Allah can know. And so when the Prophet ﷺ told him about Yunus السلام, he realized that you know such information could only be known by a prophet, especially when he is claiming to be a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these two men said to Addas, they said to him, do not let this man to make you leave your religion. Your religion is better than his. Your Christianity is better than what he has. Now these two men, were they Christians? No. They were mushrikun from Quraysh. What do they know about Christianity? But it was the kufr in their hearts and this enmity for the Prophet ﷺ that made them say whatever would make the people to be distanced from Islam. Now, Rasulullah ﷺ left Ta'if and he was rejected. But guess what? It is a promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that with every difficulty comes ease and relief. With every difficulty comes ease. Indeed, with every difficulty comes ease. And so, Rasulullah had a very hard time in Ta'if. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala followed it up with a blessing. And so, on the way back to Mecca, the Prophet camped out at night. And he was praying Qiyamul Layl. And he was reciting the Quran. So it so happened that there were some jinn who happened to be in the area and they were attracted by these words and this recitation of the Quran. So they came and started listening to the Prophet ﷺ. And they were so affected by these words that they accepted Islam. And then they went back to their people preaching the message of Islam. And so this is the story of the Islam of the jinn. That there were a group of the jinn who came to the Prophet ﷺ and they accepted Islam. Now, the jinn are a world of creatures that have intelligence. They live here on earth with us. They have a life structure just like us. They have children. They have families. They live their lives. They have clans, they have nations. They speak different languages and they follow different religions. The only difference is their life form. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them from fire. And Allah created us from clay. And they see us, but we do not see them. And so they are invisible from us. 
there can be times when humans happen to sight the jinn and you know it's not far fetched you know these these sightings that people have where they see things in the dark or you know uh, they become haunted by certain things that they see that they call ghosts or sightings of UFOs and so on and so forth. It's not far-fetched to say that these could be the jinn. Nonetheless, these jinn, they came to Rasulullah and they accepted Islam. Now, there may have been more than one incident in which jinn came to the Prophet وسلم, and accepted Islam. And the jinn are also commanded to worship Allah and to accept Islam. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created the jinn nor mankind except to worship me. And the only way to worship Allah is through, is through Islam. So the, so the Prophet ﷺ was sent to the humans, yes, but also to the jinn. He was sent to both. The story of jinn coming to the Prophet ﷺ is mentioned in two places in the Qur'an. And so it is possible that these were two separate incidents. One is in Surah Al-Jinn, and the other is in Surah Al-Ahqaf, at the end of Surah Al-Ahqaf. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Al-Ahqaf, وَإِذْ صَرَفْنَا إِلَيْكَ نَفَرًا مِّنَ الْجِنِّ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقُرْآنِ فَلَمَّا حَضَرُوهُ قَالُوا أَنْصِتُوا Remember, O Prophet, when a group of the jinn, we sent them to you to listen to the Qur'an. Then when they heard it, they said to one another, listen quietly. Then when it was finished, they returned to their fellow jinn as warners. They said, when they went back to their people, they said, O oh, our fellow jinn, we have truly heard a scripture revealed after Musa, confirming what came before it, it guides to the, to the truth and the straight way. Now, why did these jinn say, we heard a book revealed after the Torah, after Musa. Why didn't they say after Isa, since Isa came after Musa Why didn't they say after the Injil? This is one of the explanations that some of the commentators give. That this group of Jews, they came from a place in Yemen where there were Jews. And so they were followers of Musa or Islam, or you know, they, their book was the Torah. So this is what they said. And then they went on to say, Oh, our fellow jinn, respond to the caller of Allah and believe in him, he will forgive you your sins and protect you from painful punishment. And whoever does not respond to the caller of Allah will have no escape on earth, nor will they have any protectors against him. It is they who are clearly astray. So this was a story of the jinn accepting Islam, and then going back to their people as callers to Islam. So this was an example of 
something good that happened to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa after a hardship, after his experience with the people of Ta'if. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has to enter Mecca once again. And this was not easy. Especially since the message had reached Mecca that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had gone to preach in Al-Ta'if. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now had to seek the protection of someone in order to enter into his own town. Because remember that his uncle passed away. Abu Talib, he's the one who used to protect him. No one could lay hands on the Prophet ﷺ because of the protection of Abu Talib. So Rasulullah ﷺ camped outside of Mecca trying to find some protection. He first sent a message to a man known as Al-Akhnas ibn Shariq. This man was living in Mecca, but he was not from Quraysh. He was an ally of Quraysh. So when he received the message that the Prophet ﷺ is asking for protection, he said, since I am an ally, I cannot go over my authority. And I cannot give protection to someone who is from the tribe who I am an ally of. So then he he turned down the request. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he had to look for someone else. So he sent for Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail ibn Amr, he said, I cannot give you protection because the clan of Banu Amr that I am from cannot give protection to somebody who is from Banu Ka'ab. And you are from Banu Ka'ab. So he also turned down the request. So then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tried a third time. And this time he sent a request to Al-Mut'im ibn Adi. Al-Mut'im ibn Adi. He was the chief of Banu Nawfal clan, which is from Quraysh. Al-Mut'am ibn Adi, we mentioned him previously. Who remembers this name, Al-Mut'am ibn Adi? He's a kafir, but he was one of the influential people of Mecca. He was basically one of the five people who helped to put an end to the embargo. So if you remember that story of how the embargo came to an end, he was one of the individuals who helped to bring it to an end. So Al-Mut'im ibn Adi, he did accept the request. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he entered into the protection of Al-Mut'im ibn Adi. And so he spent the night at his house. And then early in the morning, Al-Mut'im, he asked six or seven of his sons to carry their swords and put on special clothes and then to go out surrounding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, escorting him to the Kaaba. When they reached the Kaaba, they took a seat watching the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam making tawaf around the Kaaba. And so Abu Sufyan came to Al-Mut'im ibn Adi and he said, are you giving him protection or are you following him? Meaning, are you one of his followers? Have you accepted Islam? And so Al-Mut'im said, I am only giving him protection. And so Abu Sufyan said, in that case, we accept your protection. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was now giving da'wah in Mecca under the protection of Al-Mut'im ibn Adi. We move on to the lessons that we learn from the journey to al taif The first lesson that we learn is the importance 
of targeting the leaders and the people of influence in society. And so we mentioned this previously. When we spoke about the Islam of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu and how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed to Allah to guide one of the two Umars. Why these two individuals in particular? Because they were influential and they would play a huge role in the spread of Islam. So notice the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went straight to the leaders of al -Tayf. He didn't go and start preaching to the regular people on the street. He went to he went to the leaders. And so when they did not accept the message, it was likely that no one else would accept the message. And so this is why he didn't spend he didn't have to spend much time in a ta'if. And so this is an important lesson that we learn to target the important and influential people in our da'wah. The second lesson that we learn, Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu was the one who was protecting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the rocks that were being thrown at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Zayd ibn Haritha was using his own body as a shield to protect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the battle of Uhud, we have similar stories of Sahaba who use their backs to protect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But this time not from rocks, but rather from, from swords or from spears. We may not have the chance to stand up to defend to defend and support the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with our physical bodies. But we can make that up by defending the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and protecting his honor. One of the tabi'een, Abu Muslim Al-Khulani, he says, do the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam think that we will let them have Rasulullah for themselves? No, we are going to compete with them. We want to get our share of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we may be centuries away from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We obviously cannot help in the battles that he waged and that the Muslims fought. But there is still a lot that we can do. And so we may not be able to do what Zayd ibn Haritha did or what the companions did on the day of Uhud. But at least we can do what we can, what is in our hands. And that is to stand up to defend the Prophet ﷺ by preaching his message, by teaching his seerah, and by standing up to defend him when he is attacked, especially in this day and age, whenever he is attacked and made fun of and mocked and ridiculed to stand up and to defend and to defend his honor. The third lesson that we learn is the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His mercy and also his high hopes that he had. Aisha radiallahu anha narrates, and this is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. She says, I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, have you experienced a day harder and more difficult than the day of Uhud? Because Aisha radiallahu anha was young, extremely young in Mecca. So she missed out on the da'wah of Mecca. So later on in Medina, she saw what happened to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the day of Uhud. It was a very difficult day. 
So she asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, have you faced anything more difficult than that day? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yes, I experienced, I experienced it at the hands of your people, meaning Quraysh. The most difficult treatment I met was on the day of Al-Aqabah, which was the day that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to At-Ta'if. He said, when I met the chiefs, inviting them to Islam, but they made no response. They did not accept my message. So I left in deep distress. I did not recover until I arrived at Qarn al-Ta'alib. And so there I raised my head. I looked up to the sky and I saw a cloud which had cast its shadow over me. I saw in it Jibreel alayhi salam. And he called upon me. He said, indeed, Allah heard what your people said to you and the response that they gave to you. And Allah has sent you the angel in charge of the mountains to order him to do to them as you wish. Then the angel of the mountains called me. He greeted me. He gave me salams. And he said, O Muhammad, Allah has heard what your people have said to you, I am the angel of the mountains and my Rabb has sent me to you so that you may give me your orders. If you wish, I will bring together these two mountains that stand opposite to each other and I will bring them crashing down on these people. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he said, what was his response? You know, imagine what he had been through being pelted with stones and being chased out of Ta'if. But he did not allow his anger to take a hold of him, but rather we see his mercy coming out. And so the Prophet wasallam said, no, I rather hope that Allah will raise from among their descendants a people who will worship Allah alone and will not associate any partners with him. And so look at how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he remained positive even after all this happened. And he said, no, perhaps their children will go on one day to accept Islam. So why destroy them? The fourth lesson that we learn, we spoke about what happened between the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the servant, the Christian servant, Adas. This was an example of giving da'wah through action. And so Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam started eating by saying Bismillah. A small Islamic act that was the cause of someone embracing Islam because Adas had never heard this before from the Arabs from these people and so that led him to inquire and to ask the Prophet and so sometimes the things that we do these small things that we may do and we may not even give it much consideration it could lead people to come and ask us about these things that we're doing then becoming curious about Islam and eventually leading them to accept Islam and there are so many stories of converts who say that what led them to Islam was that they met some Muslims and they saw that they're doing certain things a certain way that was intriguing to them and that was curious to them. It, it raised their curiosity and then they started asking and studying Islam and that was what led them to accept Islam. The fifth lesson that we learn is the positive results 
that resulted from this journey to a ta'if and that was in the Islam of the jinn and so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left Mecca for a ta'if with the intention of da'wah of spreading the message of Islam he was fed up with his own people he said there have to be other people out there in the world who may accept my message let me go and preach elsewhere and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made sure that he would not let the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa go home disappointed so after these humans rejected his message Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent another species who accepted it and that was the jinn and not only did they accept it but they then took the message back to their people and so they became da'is to Islam just like certain companions came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from outside of Mecca and we mentioned examples of this previously Abu Dhar al-Ghifari Bimad and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after they became Muslim he told them go back to your people and so they became du'a they returned back to their people giving da'wah and so what we learn from this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never let those who are sincere he will never let them da'wah and so as long as your intention is sincere and you put in the effort the fruits will be seen even if not right away even if not in your lifetime how many great scholars of Islam were not famous when they were alive and they were tortured and they were imprisoned but centuries later we today rely on their works the examples of Imam al-Bukhari the example of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah that's why one of the students of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah he said at the death of Ibn Taymiyyah he gathered the students of Ibn Taymiyyah because Ibn Taymiyyah he was he was an, op op an opponent of some of the more influential scholars who were Ash'aris and people of Bid'ah and so he was always persecuted and he died in prison and so he had written so many volumes of works but no one was allowed to spread his works so one of his students got the students of Ibn Taymiyyah together and he said by Allah work hard in passing on the works of Ibn Taymiyyah for I swear by Allah that Allah will eventually give life to these works by men who are not even alive today by men who are still in the backbones of their fathers and that's exactly what happened and so look at how many hundreds of volumes of works of Ibn Taymiyyah only became available centuries after his death the point here is that we have to put in the effort and we have to be sincere to Allah and do what we can even if we don't see any results in our lifetime in front of us eventually eventually the fruits will come when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides the, the last lesson that we learn is the permissibility of seeking protection from non-Muslims and kuffar and so this is found in the case of Al-Mut'im ibn Adi in fact even before that Abu Talib was a kafir and the Prophet wasallam was under his protection and here the Prophet wasallam was looking for protection under someone before he entered Mecca 
And so this is still something that exists even today. And we are allowed to resort to it when we are seeking protection and safety for our lives. And so it exists today in the form of what they call political asylum. You know, you're being persecuted in your homeland because of your Islam. So there's nothing wrong with seeking asylum and protection from kuffar. Now, the Prophet وسلم, was always loyal. He was always loyal to those who supported him. As we saw in the case of Abu Talib, he said, I'm going to seek Allah's forgiveness for you until Allah forbade him. With regards to Al Mut'im ibn Adi, he did not become a Muslim. He died shortly after the hijrah of the Prophet. He died a Kafir. His son became a Muslim, Al Jubair ibn Mut'im. Jubair ibn Mut'im. With regards to Al Mut'im, on the day of Badr, after the Muslims were victorious over Quraysh, and now in the hands of the Prophet وسلم, were captives of war, the Prophet وسلم, said, If Al Mut'im ibn Adi had been alive today and spoken to me about these filthy people, that's how the Prophet وسلم, referred to them. If, the pro if Al Mut'im had spoken to me on their behalf, saying, you know, free them, then I would have definitely freed them for him. So this shows us the, lo the loyalty of the Prophet وسلم, to those who helped him and were supportive of him, even though they may have been kuffar. And so with that, we come to the end of uh, these events in the 10th year of the prophethood. We'll move on next week on to one last event that happens in this year. And it is a magnificent event, a very, very important event. Uh, we will cover it in its entirety next week, insha'Allah ta'ala. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله